All right. Uh, my name is Isaac. I'm a historian here at Edison and Ford Winter Estates. Uh, and this is my Step Into History Digital Edition. Uh, today, we will talk, be talking about Thomas Edison's sci-fi novel and his predictions for the future. Uh, and so we will be talking about In the Deep of Time, as you can see from this picture. Uh, it's a novel by George Parsons Lathrop in collaboration with Thomas Edison. All right. And so we're going to start first and foremost uh, with a book called Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887. This was ooh, this was a novel written by Edward Bellamy in 1888. Uh, and essentially, it follows a gentleman from the present, 1888, that travels to the future, the year 2000. Uh, and throughout the book, he analyzes and explores this futuristic society. Uh, and well, his novel, it was a commentary on a number of social issues at the time, in which case the author, Edward Bellamy, came up with a number of several solutions uh, that the future basically solved. Uh, this wasn't the first sci-fi novel, especially the first displaced man out of time novel, especially at the time. Uh, and already, you know, writers like Jules, Jules Verne, uh, other great sci-fi novels had already appeared and were quite popular. But this one, the way that it went forward and actually discussed future technology in comparison to modern day technology, it got a lot of other authors uh, and inventors uh, intrigued about it. Uh, and so uh, essentially uh, the forum, which is a magazine, a guy named Loretis Sutton Metcalf uh, would write to Thomas Edison, January 28th of 1889, uh, and uh, basically implying that he should also write a novel and think about some future predictions. And so he says uh, here, he says, it has occurred to me that a serious article undertaking to show what invention may humbly produce 1000 years hence would be of much interest to thinking people. Are you willing to write this? I propose a length from 3000 to 4000 words and a compensation of $20 per thousand words. And so he wrote this to Thomas Edison. So you could already see that the gears were getting going. Uh, and this wouldn't be the first time somebody approached Thomas with the idea for a novel. Uh, but especially after that last book, this really got things going. And so this leads to George Parsons Lathrop, who was already uh, a poet and novelist at the time. He was relatively well known at the time. Uh, He's also a newspaper editor. He was born 1851 in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, he would die in 1898 in New York. Uh, but he first met Thomas Edison in 1885, and they he would continue to write to Thomas Edison throughout the years. Uh, and so he also saw this as an opportunity to work with the inventor. And so uh, back in 1885, when he first met Thomas Edison, uh, he and Thomas would discuss several hypothetical technological uh, improvements throughout the years. Uh, I have a little picture here of that interview, an interview with the Wizard of Menlo Park. Well, uh, Lathrop would describe Thomas Edison as able to manipulate as at will and without interruption the mysterious forces and properties of nature. In meeting him, I thought of him more as a poet or a musician than as a machinist or electrician, perfecting man's control over the elements that shape life. So obviously, George heavily looked up to Thomas Edison, uh, and he knew he was a genius. Uh, and so Thomas Edison, at the end of the 1880s, he would start on his own sci-fi novel. Uh, his novel was called Progress. Uh, and ultimately, uh, during the interview with George Parsons Lathrop in 1890, uh, he would say, these ideas are occurring to me all the time. I just jot them down here whenever they strike me, day or night, and keep them with the hope of getting the leisure to develop them. And so he does come up with... Uh, loads of ideas uh, for future technology, for ways that the future could be different. That was the way that Thomas Edison really thought in general. He would see something and say, how can I make this better? Uh, and you'll see a lot of his innovations, his patents over the years were just improvements to things that already existed. Uh, and so this process would take many months of back and forth between George Parsons Lathrop and Thomas Edison. Uh, Alfred Tate, Edison's secretary, he would uh, report that uh, to Lathrop that Edison had tried to dictate the notes to the phonograph, but that failed. But he has 
already at that point in time, uh, 56 pages of notes already. And so Thomas was just regularly writing dozens and dozens and dozens of, of these notes, these innovations, these predictions for the future uh, down. But ultimately, it was a slow uphill crawl for George to actually squeeze these out of Thomas Edison. Uh, he talks about in one letter that uh, Thomas Edison was uh, basically obsessed with uh, his iron ore mill uh, mining at that time, uh, which was a good chunk of Thomas's life. And so he really had to squeeze this out of the, uh, the inventor. Uh, ultimately, the novel progress that Thomas was working on, he would give up on writing and it would not go forward. Uh, but Lathrop, uh, with Thomas Edison uh, and his notes specifically, he would continue and he would write in the deep of time. And uh, I just have an example here of uh, another note between this is Thomas Edison and uh, George Lathrop. All right. So at the beginning of this novel, uh, which was published in newspapers, uh, it has this little preface that says, this story is the result of conversations with Thomas A. Edison, the substance of which Mr. Edison afterwards put in the form of notes written for my use. He's, his suggestions as to innovations uh, inventions and changed mechanical, industrial, and social conditions in the future here embodied, I understand to be simply hints as to what might possibly be accomplished. Mr. Edison assumes no further responsibility for them. For the story itself, I alone am responsible. Uh, and then we have a little picture here. That's actually from the uh, the publication. It says uh, facsimile of one of Mr. Edison's notes. And so the story was entirely written by George Parsons Lathrop. But it is interjected throughout the entire story with these notes that are clearly written by Thomas Edison because uh, the writing style changes and immediately it just goes into the mechanical, electrical, uh, all this different kind of uh, speech uh, that is quite hard to understand for the layman. And then he tries his best to explain how it might work. Uh, and then basically weaving all of these inventions and future things together, George Parsons wrote uh, uh, a sci-fi novel that... That was about, similarly, a gentleman that traveled to the future. And so the premise, uh, it's about a guy named George Bemis. He is a man of the past. He's from the late 1800s, so the present time when that was written. Uh, he's heartbroken, though. Uh, he put his love to, to a woman who did not return it. And so ultimately, he would agree uh, with this group called the Society of Futurity, uh, Futurity to... Uh, be put into stasis and uh, would wake up in the far future. Uh, and so ultimately, this man from the 19th century, he gets put into stasis and he wakes up in the year 2200. So 300 years since this book was written. Uh, and it then would go over his adventures through this new and unfamiliar world. Um, and George, I mean, George, uh, it's, I lied, his name is Gerald Bemis. Uh, that's a typo. Uh, it's Gerald Bemis is the character. George, the author, he would uh, write this whole love story into it, this love triangle. Uh, there was a lot of different stuff, but I'm not here to talk about uh, the romance of this sci-fi novel. I am here to talk about Thomas Edison's predictions for the future. And so the novel was produced over the course of four weeks. Uh, as you can see here, I have these are the four screen grabs I took of each of these uh, publications. So they were pub produced in a newspaper. Uh, the ones I got, I got from the Library of Congress. Uh, these ones specifically were printed in the Seattle Post uh, starting Sunday, December 13th, 1896, uh, and then every Sunday following until January 3rd, 1897. And so each of these posts, uh, these pages starts with in the deep of time. And then you can see that the whole page has a number of pictures uh, and many columns just dedicated to this story. All right, so here I'm going to talk about the ideas that Thomas Edison proposed that the future would bring and this future technology. Um, and I have basically three categories. I have the things that he got really close um, to what we have today. I have the next category, which is, yeah, we basically have this technology, but the way he put it, it doesn't make the most sense. There's a lot of extra steps involved. And then I have, uh, we don't have this technology yet slash maybe it's a little silly uh, because we have surpassed that technology. And so close as can be predictions that are reminis reminiscent of modern day technology. This is the first section here. And so to start, we have 
electric trains. In the novel, he wrote about how there was an electric train on a railway that moves at dizzying speeds of 150 miles per hour. And that sounds incredibly familiar to our current day, you know, our bullet trains or the maglev trains, which are electric, uh, and they reach speeds of 150 to 250 miles per hour. So immediately faster. If that's not dizzying speeds, I don't know what is. And then I have a picture here of the Shanghai maglev train. So you can kind of see how I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to have a Thomas Edison uh, part of the book that he proposed, and then I'm going to have a real life counter. And so he's got electric ocean liners and freighters instead of steam. And so obviously you can see when this was written as steamboats were the, the big thing. Uh, but we do have electric ocean liners. At least we're really getting there. Uh, the Yara Birkeland, uh, which ironically is called the Tesla of the sea. Um, is it's uh battery powered and it's autonomous uh and so uh you can have someone on there but otherwise it is robotic and the fact that it follows the same path um over in scandinavia and it basically delivers to like three ports going back and forth and it's a cargo ship uh it has this big battery that runs on hydropower so we're getting the, the two electric ocean liners that don't require fuel sun engines uh which derived electricity directly from sunlight uh and then i have a quote here that thomas edison actually said in 1914 saying i'd put my money on the sun and solar energy what a source of power i hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that uh which is very on the nose uh for kind of what a lot of people are trying to do today but obviously we do have solar power solar thermal pallet power and solar architecture which is uh, basically, when you tie in structures with solar power, such as putting panels on the roofs of houses so they don't have to fill up fields, all that stuff. Uh, photovoltaics, uh, that is the term of taking sunlight and turning it into electricity. And so obviously, in the novel, they talk about this big future thing from the year 2200, but we've gained that here in the year 2000 and some change. This is really interesting to me. Uh, and it was part of the reason that I wanted to do this whole thing after finding out about this book. And that's uh, that there were little air packets that were flying around all by their lonesome. Too small for people. They went automatically. They were express and mail carriers. And does that not sound like modern day delivery drones such as Amazon Prime Air or some other uh, brands such as Zipline or Wingcaptor that deliver mail and packages to people's houses? Uh, and so... Thomas Edison, he definitely saw some ideas onto uh, what might be coming here in the far future. Bicycles uh, were no longer a fad or nuisance. Separate paths were provided for them. And on these electric bicycles, tricycles, and electric carriages were run with power supplied from stations at regular intervals and at all hotels by recharging and storage batteries. We have electric bikes and cars, uh, and carriages today. Uh, I've ridden on electric bikes that you can rent in different cities that you have to plug into charging stations that are regularly throughout. We have designated bike paths. Uh, larger cities have them right on the road. Otherwise, uh, they have other bike paths that are separate. And definitely we have charging stations for electric cars, uh, electric bikes, all these other things. Uh, I have got a picture of Tesla here because obviously there are Tesla stations uh, all over the country now. Uh, and so it's a future that he saw as incredibly viable in 1896. Everybody in short had civilization brought to his front door wherever he lived or within easy reach of his home. And I think that's a lot of what we can see today. I've got food delivery, all these services that bring stuff directly to you, such as DoorDash, Uber Eats, Amazon delivery delivered right to your door. Electronic libraries is interesting because in the, in the book, it talked about how libraries would deliver books to your houses. And we can do that electronically, uh, a number of library sources, so you can still read and do what you need to. Uh, and then streaming services as well, just bringing the world to your home. You don't need to go to the movie theater. You don't got to wait for something. You can just watch it on your TV. All right, this is pretty interesting as well. So this is about uh, vaccines and just general health. Uh, in the book, they talk about how basically doctors and scientists in the future determined that the white corpuscles uh, of the blood are the policemen of organized beings against microbes. And you got to educate these certain cells uh, to basically be used to bad cells, bad sicknesses, bad viruses, and they will be capable of resisting them. And they did this 
by right here at the bottom it says children received an inoculation with the virus once in seven years by compulsory law and the diseases against which it had was directed it had become rare and basically i tripped over that a little bit uh they made it mandatory for children to get uh vaccines and other shots which is what we have today when a baby is born they have to get shots uh Obviously, we have for human children, but even like you get a cat and a dog, you got to get them shots early on so that they can be immune to these very common diseases. Uh, routine shots for newborns, for children to prevent uh, measles, uh, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, all of these things. And so he talked about this here, uh, that they would have things to stop rabies, consumption, diphtheria, cholera, splenic fever, typhoid, yellow and scarlet fever, malaria, all this kind of stuff. So definitely something that we see today that they talked about all the way back in 1896. Uh, no more animal-based food in the future, according to this book. It was mostly vegetable mixtures that now contain the same nutrients as meat. And we definitely have those alternate food sources today. Plant and soy-based meat. I got a picture of Beyond Beef and uh, Impossible Burgers that we have today. The Impossible Whopper from Burger King, for example. Uh, they're very popular as alternate sources, and a lot of these are made out of beans and soy and other plants. And then alternate milk, uh, which I thought was really interesting that they mentioned it. So they said among the liquids that we had a new sort of milk somewhat resembling uh, kumis, which is fermented mare's milk, uh, but with daintier taste and delicious fragrance. And we definitely have alternate sources of milk today. Uh, soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, coconut milk, rice milk. Um, I use a lot of alternate milk sources uh, just because they last longer in the my refrigerator. Normal milk can last a couple of weeks. I get some oat milk. It can last for three months. Uh Horses were but little use for travel and existed mainly as a form of preserved life like deer in parks or for racing purposes. Uh, they were now not much more than domestic pets like cats and dogs, but then also at the bottom, he talks about how we saw some draft horses and carriage horses in use on farms or on the road we travel, uh, we were uh, traveling afoot. And uh, definitely in modern day, we use cars and other things instead of horses for travel, but there are certain groups. There's also on farms, people use horses all the time. We do still have horse races, uh, but then a lot of people also, they get horses just to own because they, they care about horses and they have them as as pets really. Uh, and so we, we still have horse carts. I have a picture of one that you could rent, for example, in a city uh, for primary, but we don't use them as primary travel. All right, next section, it's called Right Idea, Wrong Execution. Predictions that get to the same conclusion but with a lot of extra steps. And for example, I'm starting with uh, spaceships. Uh, so they talk about uh, these new spaceships. It's an invention to fly to Mars and they were called anti-gravitation machines, uh, also known as the Interstellar Express. Uh, astronauts are called aeronauts in this book. And anti-gravitation machines or the Interstellar Express car was made out of an ore found that contained metal which yielded helium. Uh, and because helium is immune to gravity, that's what they talk about in the book, uh, the ore is as well. And so these ores, they can fly right out from Earth being immune to gravity, uh, which isn't entirely how science worked. Uh, but I have, a, uh, this is a little picture here from the actual newspaper. And so we have a gentleman leaving this spaceship here. It's behind him. It's not the largest thing. Uh, he's a little weary because the trip was a little bit hard. Today, obviously, we have spaceships, space shuttles. Uh, they do not use helium. Uh, they use main engines as well as rocket boosters to thrust it to orbit. Uh, and we do not have humans on Mars yet, only robots. All right, so next is factories. They describe them as a forest made of iron and steel. And then again, I have a picture here. This is what the factories looked like. Basically, all of this uh, crowded machinery, giant wheels, giant pistons going at the same time, incredibly dangerous. Uh, and that's why it was called a forest, because it was just full of all of this stuff, beams, levers, cranks, and rods of vast machinery. Um, and all of this tangle of mechanism was run for the most part automatically and is governed by one man and that it covered many acres and it was nearly impossible to walk through factories today i have a picture here with the robotic arms that are making car parts a lot of factories today uh, we do have a lot of automation in them we also have huge factories that span multiple acres uh, and so i have the boeing everett factory over there in washington state which is 
uh, I think the largest factory in the United States. Um, but these aren't obviously the exact same. We do have plenty of factories that have multiple people working in them. And even the ones that are almost entirely automated, we still have multiple employees working there. Uh, and uh, so that's why it's in this section, not the last one, is because it's not the exact same. And uh, a lot of factories, you're not supposed to walk on the factory floor willy nilly, but there are safe pathways to walk to the building. Artificial silk. I'm not going to have to read this entire thing, uh, but essentially it's this huge process. Uh, disintegrated cellulose after being thoroughly bleached and dazzled to whiteness, dissolved in chlorinated alcohols under pressure, and then afterwards it's put, put through cylindrical hydraulic press, uh, and then you have small discs made of sapphire, and basically all of this combines with even more chemicals until you get this beautiful silk, uh, the color of sapphire. And they're saying it's far more dazzling and beautiful than the silk formerly obtained from the silkworm. We do have artificial silk or faux silk today, uh, made from a mixture of different you know, natural fibers, such as cotton, wool, and linen, uh, or even synthetic ones, such as uh, rayon, nylon, or polyester. Uh, they, artificial silk is still typically considered not nearly as good as uh, authentic silk when it comes especially to price. Uh, and so that's why I have it in this section because it doesn't, it's, they haven't reached that point yet. Our, people much prefer the artificial. Uh, same thing with diamonds. Um, I thought this was interesting. So his way that we made diamonds, this huge, uh, immense process. Uh, it was made possible to manufacture pure diamonds by subjecting prepared metal crystals to the action of time, heat, and pressure while immersed in a bisulfide of carbon in bulbs of pure quartz. By magnetically deflected arc, the surface was plumbagoed, and pure iron was electroplated over the ball until it increased to 20 times its original diameter. So it's this huge event but uh, we make lab-grown diamonds today, and it's it's a lot more simpler than all of this stuff that they go through. Uh, there are two main ways, ways of creating uh, uh, lab-grown diamonds, which for all intents and purposes are the exact composition of diamond. Uh, one is just high pressure, high temperature, uh, and basically they put it in a big metal sheen, a machine that crunches it and heats it up, uh, and basically doing what the earth does over a long period of time, but over a short period of time, and then also chemical vapor disposition. And so it's another similar way to make diamonds that uses uh, chemicals and uses what the diamond is made out of basically to make them as well. And so the, the three diamonds I have here, the one on the, the, the left here with like the black ring, that's the chemical one. The one up front, that is the high pressure, high temperature, and the one on the right is a natural diamond. And then of course, all of these diamonds, uh, they would get cut and cleaned until they look like the diamonds that we can put on jewelry. Leather. Uh, artificial leather was produced by electrical fixture of nitrogen and carbohydrates. Shoes were molded directly from material. One machine making 300 pairs of shoes in an hour. They were afterwards passed through another process to make them flexible. And the porosity of the leather varied to suit different climates. Um, we have faux leather today. Uh, typically, it's either polyurethane film or polyvinyl chloride. Um, we don't, I mean, people do use, not shoe molds, but we don't basically fill them with this material. We just mold around and then cut the, the leather or the foot fake leather. Uh, we do have a number of shoes that are made by molds and especially ones that have large pores, which made me think of modern day Crocs. Uh, but uh, we do have leather today. Obviously, it's a little bit different than the aspect that they were using back then. All right. And then this this section is called not yet. Uh, these are predictions that we have yet to encounter or seem a little silly. And so these are some of the, the most amount of sci fi in the book was all these things that uh, we haven't really encountered yet. Or because we've surpassed the technology. So we have the walking balloon. Uh, here we have a walking balloon in this picture that's from the story. Uh, it's a shallow car with small hollow sails of silk above it. Uh, and basically, it can go 30 feet up, and then it walks on these two long aluminum legs, and it can go up to 15 miles per hour. And it's used to travel over a lot of hills and other certain areas. And so you would take the 150-mile-per-hour train, and then you get off that, get on your walking balloon, and then walk the rest of the way to your house or to a, a structure. Kind of silly. 
uh, we have different things that can go faster than that, that can hold more people that work a little bit better. The closest thing I can think of is a hot air balloon, but it's not walking. Vivification. So this is the process that Gerald Bemis, the, the main character of the story, it's how he got to the future. And it's this huge chemical thing. He wasn't frozen in stasis. Uh, he was basically covered in chemicals, uh, injected with a chemical that slowed down his heart, uh, covered with this compound, put in this glass cylinder that they physically heated up and then tapered to a point and hermetically sealed. So that is what you see in the picture here. Um, and then this whole thing was also filled with a gas that basically preserved him and they would take care of this, uh, this glass cylinder with a man in it, basically this cocoon, this chrysalis uh, for 300 years. Uh, and the Society of Futurity would carefully watch this. And then finally, when the time came, they opened it up uh, and his body gradually got back to normal and he woke up and there he was 300 years in the future. Uh, so, yeah, we we don't have that process uh, or anything super similar to it. Air cutters. These were essentially flying buses. Uh, they were larger airships. You can see that it looks almost like a bus today. Uh, even a nice little flag on there, too. But uh, that's what's in this picture of these air cutters. You see a couple ones over there in the back. Some use the sails from the balloons as well. But very popular way of, of, of traveling. Uh, the sky is used for travel a lot. So that way they can use the ground for other things. That, that was their reasoning behind that. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of the, the, the science behind all of this because it was even a little bit too much for me. Now, basically, they use pressurized air uh, in that air is coming up beneath and they have these little things that flip at the same time. And when they flip, they cause a little air to go up. And basically, all that air pushes this thing into the air. Uh, so it doesn't have any wings or anything or propeller. It just has a little sail that can use it to turn and then it uses the wind to lift it up. I, I don't know. He's ahead of his time, I suppose. Intelligent apes, uh, a group called the Darwinian Society, according to the book. Uh, they were able to educate apes to uh, an extraordinary degree so that they were able to. Uh, to be quite proficient in human language. They were skilled in agriculture under proper direction. They made very good servants for rougher, rougher and simpler kinds of housework uh, mm -hmm. or carrying baggage or other things. And so we have this picture here where it said they made very good servants. We're not there. We don't make animals, our, our servants. Um, the hypnotizing machine. And so uh, this came at a pretty pivotal plot point in the book. Uh, uh, as you can see in here, the, the picture, uh, but essentially it's a machine that you unroll and it's a glittering curtain and you can hypnotize someone, uh, and they use it, uh, medically, uh, for the location of nervous disorders and weak organisms. And it says it's also applied officially to the examination of candidates for the civil service and for high office. Uh, that way they can basically make sure that they're, they're good people. Uh, by by hypnotizing them and having them tell them the truth. But otherwise, uh, laws of the world and all nations forbid the use in any other way. So it's pretty uh, it's a pretty you know, secret object that you're not really supposed to use. Um, telegraph to Mars. Thomas Edison, he loved the telegraph. Uh, his first two children, their names, uh, his nicknames were Dot and Dash because he loved Morse code so much. And uh, that definitely translates 300 years into the future when uh, when we finally want to contact Mars, we turn a mountain range, the Penakey Mountain Ranges, I think over in what, Wisconsin. They turned it into a giant magnet. Uh, it's full of iron. They put a number of telephone poles. So that's why I have in this, this photo here. So behind these characters, there are these telephone poles with a number of wires. These are copper wires and uh, magnets created and you get a chunk of iron, you wrap copper around it, it's a magnet. Uh, and so that's what they did to an entire mountain range. They basically covered it in, in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these telephone poles with copper. So it's a giant magnet. And then to talk to Mars, we basically turn the magnet on and off in intervals using Morse code. And so when it does this, then basically Mars gets this big uh, wave of magnetic force you know, dot, 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 dash, dot, dash. Uh, and 
it's kind of silly, but uh, mayhaps it'll it'll work. But you can see that, especially for the 1890s, when telegraphs were such a big deal, uh, it was pretty important to Thomas Edison. Uh, and so that's what I, I talk about here. This one is is pretty interesting. Uh, and so I have the same picture because that's that's uh, that's what we have in the foreground now is the sun telephone. I labeled this section one heck of a sun, and uh, it's pretty wild. Uh, honestly, I don't know entirely if this one was Thomas Edison's idea. The Sun Telephone, most likely, the story behind it. I I don't know if it was him or George or George Blathrop. And so, essentially, they created a telephone that can contact with the sun. And uh, when they contacted the sun, all they got back were strange and awful moanings and the main character gerald's like what could that be and there's an there's a martian by the way that a guy named uh, that's a it's a friend there uh and the martian's like well uh in our in our country in our in our our planet we talk about how the sun is actually uh where the lost souls go uh those souls that were basically not good people in life and so, as as you can see in the quote, it says, do you mean to say, I asked, that what we regard as the main physical force of light, warmth, life, and heat is hell? Uh, and so, yeah, according to this story, um, the sun is is the place where the souls go to the afterlife uh, to suffer. Uh, and they are actually used to power the combustion of the sun. Um, that's why that's in that sec this section here. I say not yet, but we can hopefully say never uh we can hope but i have that here because that one just blew my mind when i read that cloud telegraphy uh we have something similar uh i mean we have we can put lights on clouds we can shine big lights into the sky uh but the way this works is that this was used for ships uh in the night if two ships are out there they didn't have radios to talk with each other they didn't have telephones and so what they would do is they would shoot beams into the sky and again use morse code on these beams and so other ships in the area miles away could see the 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 light on the ships i mean the light from the ships on the clouds and be like oh there's a ship over in this location we can avoid it and uh it says it's uh it has saved many lives prevented collisions and caught many fugitive criminals all through that this cloud telegraphy and so i just think we're past this technology that's why i said not yet Gold and silver were obtained by the reaction between volatized sulfur and iron. Uh, and so we would create, we'd then create gold and silver in the future out of sulfur and iron. Uh, we can't really do that kind of alchemy. Um, but platinum was now the standard of value. Its rate of value was very high and very little of it was ever seen in circulation, but it made a very solid standard. And so uh, this covers a little bit of uh, economic, but also uh, the alchemy of, of creating silver and gold we don't have that today teeth uh you could regrow teeth in this story by putting calcareous antisepticized bandages in your mouth and your teeth would just grow right back which would be a beautiful thing maybe one day these are called plastic style molded houses and you can see i have a picture of thomas edison here uh and so the idea was that the same way we make molds with plastic things we create giant iron uh structures uh and these giant iron structures are these giant molds that you pour this cement like structure in and then the molds close they superheat and then they open up and then within those big iron molds is a house but not just house huge structures state capitals and all government or municipal buildings and numerous vast churches with the gorgeous chapels are built on even a greater scale of magnificence and massive proportions and designs of exquisite beauty uh, because you use this. And uh, the, the story talks about how because of these molds, you could carve into the molds, uh, you know, beautiful statues, beautiful frescoes, all these different things. And then because of that, when it makes the house, it comes out, then the houses all have these in the churches all have these statues and everything. And he talks about how it's even more grandeur than all of the beautiful art from the years past, which is a little silly. Uh, and so the reason I have a picture of Thomas is because if you weren't familiar, Thomas Edison, he had, uh, he had a cement company, uh, uh, 
Portland cement. And he did make these kind of prefab houses out of cement. It wasn't the same concept. It wasn't giant metal iron things that closed together, heated it up and then opened. It was you just built it level by level. Uh, but you, yeah, you can explore. Uh, there are pictures of these these concrete homes that Thomas Edison created. But here we just have a next little prototype. Uh, but whilst conversing with my fellow historians, my my good friend uh, and coworker Tim brought up that uh, plastic sheds. Many people have plastic sheds in their backyards that we use to store tools and other things. They're shaped kind of like houses, and a lot of times these are made in molds because they're the way that they're plastic. Obviously, a lot of it would be plastic pieces molded and then placed together, but Maybe it's not so far from the future that eventually we're going to have three story tall structures made out of that same plastic molds, uh, but maybe a little harder material. I don't know, but this was his vision for the future. The Arctic Commonwealth, large flourishing community of two to three million people living in Antarctica. Uh, and it was uh, rejoicing in the genial warmth diffused by its central volcanoes. We do not have two to three million people living in the Antarctic Commonwealth. But we do have the, for example, the McMurdo Research Station, which is where researchers go down to, to research down there, scientists. Uh, there are a number of smaller research stations. So maybe one day we'll have millions of people living in the Antarctic. And then uh, a little bit about world government because Thomas Edison didn't just stop with technology. Uh, the Federation of the World has been achieved, is what it's called. The nations of Europe and Asia, with Africa and their several unions, cooperate with us through a world committee of 20. And the fierce light of honor and responsibility and watchfulness that beats upon these 20 gives them no chance to fool or prevaricate with the race. Besides, they don't want to do so. Because in the year 2200... It is happier and pleasant to be honest, and it is the highest kind of diplomacy, which I think is pretty hopeful. Uh, maybe one day we'll 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 live in in that kind of perfect government with these honest people. But who's to say? And then I just have the next couple of pages are just a number of innovations I did not add because there's so much in these these four publication published uh, newspaper. Uh, posts that you ultimately you could find even more things to analyze extended lifespan life brew that's not alcoholic but as stimulating as wine i don't know what that means entirely uh night and day combined uh we have glowworm lighting so soft lights all over the place uh small periods of sleeping which some people do practice uh different things major cities are now uh giant trading posts i do have uh People do not live in big cities anymore. They are spread out through the country in small towns, villages, and hamlets. And honestly, it just provided a very beautiful little setting when I was reading the story where uh, just giant green fields because we use farms in between all these hamlets. Uh, and then cities are only used as trading posts. And most of the structures in the cities have been torn down or basically turned into museums because they no longer use skyscrapers. They no longer use these larger buildings because everyone lives in these nice little hamlets. So all these different ideas uh, lastly, I do have, these are just two, the last two photos that were in the newspaper uh, that didn't have to do with technology, but I figured why not have every single photo in the newspaper here. Uh, and I just think they're nice. All right. I do have my work cited. I got a lot of this from uh, the the newspaper itself, uh, which I got through the, the Library of Congress. Um, Smithsonian. I learned about this through Rutgers University, through their Edison papers. But uh, I do want to say that uh, please join us in just a couple weeks uh, for the Philadelphia Athletics, Connie Mack and Thomas Edison, and join Holly Schaefer for her digital discussion. It will be Tuesday, March 19th at 1030 a.m. You can find the Zoom link on our calendar for March 19th at edisonford.org, a lot like today. Uh, and then... On that note, do you guys have any questions for me here at the end of my presentation uh, or any questions on uh, In the Deep of Time? Uh, it's my pleasure, Maxine. Uh, thank you for being here to listen. All right, everybody, this will go on YouTube afterwards. And so if you wanted to go back through uh, and explore everything, uh, it should be posted in just a few days. Uh, thank you 
uh, Daniel. Uh, I had a really fun time analyzing this, uh, and I think it was incredibly fascinating because the moment I found out that Thomas Edison, in a weird roundabout way, wrote a science fiction novel, uh, I had to read it for myself. All right, everybody, on that note, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me, and have a fantastic day.